Um, uh, I just want to say what a privilege it is and well as a personal pleasure to welcome you to the here. I want to say uh, uh, to my embarrassment that we have actually just met now, but I've known her work for the past several decades. Uh, it's been really foundational um, for her uh, book on women in 19th century Egypt has had a prominent place in the syllabus and in the seminar that I run on, on gender relations in the pre-modern period, and it is truly foundational. Uh, uh, and I'd just like to, to, to read a little something, uh, since um, the, the roster of what she's accomplished in her publications is, is available there in the brochure, uh, uh, and it's widely known, but to read a little something from uh, the introduction to her, her uh, work on um, women in 19th century Egypt, uh, uh, in, in, as I say, in the introduction. Um, women's history in the sense of linear progression thus began with the penetration of Western ideas which gradually permeated and transformed the receiving society. Women's history in the third world becomes the history of an intellectual elite acquainted with Western thought who initiated the debate on women's role in society, a debate which eventually filtered down and took concrete legal and political form. Idealist and derivative, this line of analysis takes one small part of women's history for the whole, limits historical inquiry to the intellectual realm, and neglects indigenous economic and social structures and their development over time. Now, that kind of view is probably considerably qualified now, but it's qualified in part because of work like this. And this, this, this uh, uh, 30 years ago was very widespread. And it just does raise an issue that when we talk about gender studies, the important subject, that when one looks in many curricula, especially not that long ago, you would look what's covered, and you would, you would encounter issues and topics that had to do with basically three countries, basically the United States, Canada, and Britain. And then that whole world out there didn't get much, much attention. And it's really been the work of people like Judith Tucker uh, that has spread this out, and of course specifically our region, and so it's, it's really, I, I wanted to speak to that, that marvelous accomplishment. Now, having said this, I dutifully looked at the CV um, to sort of check on the topic, which seemed to be a departure from some of these. I didn't find an article on it, and so uh, uh, I'm, without further ado, I'm going to turn the podium over to Professor Tucker, but it does whet the anticipation, because I, I thought that I might find an article that would, would uh, be a segue into this topic. So let me let me stop here, and as I say, how, how pleased we are to welcome you to the here, and I'm certainly looking forward to her presentation. I want to thank Carl for the very kind introduction. Um, boy, 30 years ago, uh, <laughs> I, I, I hadn't really thought about it. That is true. And uh, also I want to thank, uh, of course, uh, Jessica and Brian, uh, Tim and Lexi for this really, for this opportunity to come to Northwestern and to participate in this conference. And so uh, we were just chatting about, uh, well, with others about how exciting it's been to hear about some of the new research also being done. And uh, it's been a very rich and, for me so far, rewarding experience just being here today. And this is a new project uh, for me, or relatively new. I, I've had been sort of toying with it for a few for, for a few years, but not but not many. And so I, it's exciting for me to be able to uh, give you some of my thoughts today about um, how I'm going to approaching this, um, and uh, look forward to hearing uh, from you as well. So, uh, well, pirates. I, I, I fell into it. Uh, I, 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 unfortunately, I don't have time to tell you how I fell into it, but um, for individuals who might be interested later, I could, uh, I could give you the story. But um, as you believe that as the quintessential outlaws and bandits, sea pirates have long posed a challenge to political power, to full sovereignty, if you like, on multiple levels. Uh, their mobility enables them to elude control. Their practice of violence calls state monopolies of force into question. Uh, their flouting of the law places them beyond the reach of disciplinary institutions. Their mocking of convention renders them immune to social pressures and to shame. If popular culture is any indication, we are fascinated by them. 
and uh, witnessed the huge success of the Pirates of the, Car of the Caribbean, um, but also um, the enthusiastic reception of the fictionalized account of Arhama bin Jabir. Uh, this is the Corsair, yeah, written by Abdelaziz al Mahmoud, who is a Qatari author, which traces the career of this most famous pirate of Qatar. And surely this fascination here and there has every, everything to do, or at least something to do, with the sense that pirates elude many of the strictures of our own existence, that they live larger, they live freer, they realize our fantasies of escape from the clutches of all the different forms of power that shape our lives, constrain our movements, constrain our desires. Now what I want to do here is to interrogate this relationship between pirates and power on the Middle East margins. And by that I mean in the Western Mediterranean on the one side and the Arab Gulf uh, on the other. And my interest here and my connection to the theme of the conference lies in the way that pirate stories bring the nature of the transformation of the state from the early modern to the modern into sharper focus. Um, so I, I'm a historian, and this is really, uh, really focuses on a particular historical moment, the transition of the early modern to the modern state. I want to raise questions about what pirates have to teach us about power as it was exercised by the early modern and modern states, both in and on the region, and also about the ways people on the margins uh, politically, socially, geographically, contributed to the shaping of that state power as it evolved from the modern, uh, early modern into the modern period. So, first, a very, a very quick background, which is familiar to uh, most, if not all of you, no doubt, um, uh, about piracy. Um, it was in the early modern period, the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, that states around the globe began to expand their coercive <coughs> power to acquire the arms, the institutions, the organization, to impose their will on growing numbers of people, whether their own subjects or those they encountered abroad. And this was, of course, the age of the dramatic expansion of the European sea-based empires, the Spanish and the Portuguese, and then the Dutch, French, and British, whose wealth and power was based on the sea trade and on the transport of goods to and from, from far-flung lands that they conquered, or at least came to dominate in some form. Um, the seas, in particular the Mediterranean, the Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, including the Arab Gulf, came to be crisscrossed by corridors of navigation, trade routes plied by the ships of empire. Now, as a consequence, it was also what came to be known as the golden age of piracy. Uh, piracy is by definition a parasitic activity, and as the host flourishes, so does the parasite. Uh, maritime violence surged, uh, pir piratical attacks on shipping, the armed boarding of ships, the confiscation of cargo, the capturing of crew and passengers, and the takeover of the ship itself increased dramatically in number in this period. Um, any merchant ship that took to the seas faced the threat of predatory attack. And people of all backgrounds undertook sea voyages and you know, people, whether it be the Mediterranean, or the Atlantic, or the Indian Ocean, um, everybody felt nervous getting on a ship. Uh, there, were, there was a, a sense of trepidation. The specter of falling into pirate hands haunted those who embarked. In the Western Mediterranean, for example, the anxieties surrounding sea travel were nurtured by a burgeoning, a burgeoning literature of captivity narratives, um, and also by a robust oral tradition that um, exposed the sufferings of those who had been captured by pirates and enslaved on both southern and northern shores. And of course, there was only uh, there was not only emotional anguish, uh, but also serious economic costs from the disruption dis disruption of trade. Um, and I, I hasten to point out that pirates uh, uh, knew no boundaries in many ways. That the, the, those who sail pirates who sailed the seas in this period in the Mediterranean, and also to a certain extent in the Arab Gulf, came from all different uh, places, right? all different places, from Northern Europe, from Southern Europe, from North Africa, from the Arab East. Um, you have, it was a, uh, a pretty much uh, equal opportunity field. 
So, early modern states were concerned about pirates and brought their newly acquired coercive power to bear on the problem. And the first step was to develop a legal framework that criminalized piracy in some novel ways and gave state power a free hand in its use of force against pirates, or at least a freer hand. Um, drawing on the classical legal tradition, but adding elaborations of their own, European legal theorists developed the concept of pirates as hostis humani generis, or enemies of all humankind. Um, the implications were serious ones. This was not just a, a set of, um, uh, you know, uh, it was not an abstraction. This is not an abstraction at all. It had real legal implications. Um, pirates were deemed an enemy that any state could attack, capture, and kill. And they had no rights. They did not even have the rights of common criminals uh, once they were captured. They stood outside the law, and indeed they stood outside morality. Just as they did not themselves, so the logic went, they did not themselves recognize the laws and morals of humankind, they were therefore not deserving of human treatment. So, you could unilaterally break any agreement made with them, you could even renege on promises or sworn oaths without compunction. This is in, in a period where, where the sworn, sworn oath still carries uh, an enormous uh, uh, moral weight. And they were, in the Gavin's terms, a form of bare life, excluded from political society, and subject to sovereign violence at will. Now, interestingly, and perhaps a little bit by way of comparison, we can turn to the legal discourse on the southern shores. Um, and specifically what's going on among Muslim jurists uh, in uh, North Africa. Now, there they consigned pirates to categories of persons outside the usual protections of the law, um, but they had specific, they were assimilated in specific ways to pre-existing uh, uh, legal categories. Homegrown pirates were highway bandits who committed the crime of Herava, and were subject to hudud punishments, ranging from banishment to execution. Um, pirates from Europe were enemies of Islam, were assimilated to that category, opponents in a jihad of the seas, and could be killed in battle. If they were captured alive, however, they were assimilated to the category of war captive, and the legal rules for the treatment and ransom of captives came into place. So I think the important uh, th uh, thing I want to note here is that Islamic legal theorists did not seem to have a separate legal category for the pirate as such, unlike the European legal theorists. An indication, I would suggest, not of acceptance of piracy, um, but of a different way of thinking about pirates. Uh, but yes, they were criminals, but they were uh, criminals who still, like other criminals, remained inside the city. So the Arab Gulf at the end of the early modern period provides one of many possible examples of the European, of the implications of the European legal frame. That is the unbridled use of state violence under these, the, uh, under their, these, these new rubrics against those accused of piracy. So after labeling the Khawasim pirates, a British naval expedition attacked and laid siege to Ras al Khaimah in 1819. And although the Khwarezm forces themselves demonstrated spirited resolution in the eyes of the British general in command, um, they were heavily outgunned and the town was taken. It was not to end there. British forces captured or destroyed all Khwarezm ships uh, in port and elsewhere in the Gulf, razed Ras al Khaimah to the ground dismantled all fortified houses and towers in the neighboring Arab coastal towns. So it was pretty much a scorched earth policy. Uh, a major debate has taken place among historians as to whether the Khawasim or others categorized as pirates by the British were at all deserving of the title or would better be viewed as defenders of their traditional trade routes against various forms of armed outside intervention. 
We don't have time to rehearse that debate here, but for our purposes, um, this chapter in Gulf history, I think, illustrates quite clearly how the charge of piracy could justify an overwhelming use of force and the reduction, both figurative and literal, of an enemy to bear life. And when there was not force, there was always the threat of force. And the British victory over the Khawasim opened the way for the imposition of a treaty in 1820 between the British and many of the Gulf Arabs. Um, it, the sheikhs formerly of, oh, well, the sheikh of the former, really, at this point, Russell Khaimah, of Sharjah, of Rajman, of Bahrain, among others, were prevailed upon to sign a treaty that made it clear that in the future, any one of them who committed acts labeled piracy would forfeit both life and goods without reference to any form of due process. Now, there were other ways that early modern states used their power when it came to piracy. And uh, the other major way was really by way of manipulation through inducements and remunerations. Um, the golden age of piracy, as I'm sure many of you are aware, was also the golden age of privateering and corsairing. Two terms for essentially the same phenomenon, and that is the harnessing of piracy to serve state interests. Uh, early modern states, in Europe and North Africa in particular, commissioned pirates to attack their enemies. In an age of many contests over far-flung trade routes and colonial possessions, most states had only modest navies at their disposal, and so it made sense to call upon pirates as navy auxiliaries who could be authorized to attack enemy ships, to seize enemy goods, to capture enemy sailors. Um, and there were other advantages as well, Privateers and corsairs could make valuable contributions to state revenues. For the Maghrebi states in particular, corsairing was an important source of needed monies and scarce goods in a time when their traditional trade routes were being taken over by European merchants. Um, the states of Algiers, Tunis, Tripoli, operating with a fair degree of autonomy under the Ottoman Empire, all employed corsairs who sailed with formal authorization of the state and were obliged to register their pri prizes and hand over the state's share upon their return to port. The state struck its bargain. If you operate within the boundaries that we established, you will reap rewards in the form of your share of the prize, and perhaps even your share of state power in some instances, and your actions will be cloaked in legality. So, were pirates persuaded of the advantages of operating under state auspices? Uh, many were, in fact. There were tangible benefits from their point of view. They, uh, by and large, they retained their autonomy on board ship, and they acquired legal status that protected them from pursuit and prosecution, at least by their home countries. From the vantage point of the state, it was a manipulation that served dual purposes. It could widen attacks on enemies, and it could bring pi pirates under its control, shaping and containing their activities through a reward system. But it was also a system that ran into complications. Uh, many of the captains and sailors on board these authorized, authorized ships had been and might again be simple pirates, pirates on their own account. The line between privateer corsair on the one hand and the pirate on the other was a very fuzzy one. Uh, in principle, the privateer or corsair and the pirate were distinct. The privateer served the state, and the pirate served himself. But in practice, pirates moved in and out of state service. Uh, their actions, after all, as private or privateer, were fairly indistinguishable. Uh, many, many of them, as I said, had pirate backgrounds, and they proved ready to take advantage of opportunities to attack unauthorized targets, acting on their own and not following the rules. Um, and as in one capture that is described in this letter that the uh, Day of Algiers uh, wrote to his English treaty partners in 1749. As you can see, he's basically narrating a, 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 an incident in which one of the Algerian Corsair captains um, uh, met some English ships, and at the time, Algiers and England had a treaty, 
Um, and then he uh, went on board to examine their papers, um, and he decided that their papers were not in order, basically, and so he, he, he captured the ships and the goods and the uh, people on board. So, the day found himself in a little bit of an embarrassing situation because it was a treaty, uh, it, it did contravene an existing treaty, and so he has to uh, engage in this delicate business of apologizing uh, for the actions of his corsair. So, let us turn now for a moment to the modern state, the transition to the modern state, and consider the workings of what we might consider hegemonic power, um, power that uh, at least uh, aspires to secure the consent of the governed, uh, a power that aspires to seduce and socialize us to embrace its agenda. So where did our pirates stand in relation to these new forms of state power, or at least new aspirations that emerge in the modern period? Um, and I want to suggest that this form of power was not particularly effective in controlling people on the margins. And that by studying piracy, we can learn something about how modern forms of state power, as they emerged, met with resistance that set some limits. And further, we need to entertain the idea that the modern state did not, in fact, aspire to fully tame and incorporate the pirate, but rather needed him to remain more or less as he was, as a form of life that was not welcome in civic order. So, um, first, uh, we can consider the growing ambitions of the state to control its population through some kind of process of socialization. Um, I mean, in the sort of, I guess, Foucaultian version of this, it's, it's very European-oriented, uh, European focus, and uh, focusing on the institutions that emerged in the 19th century, the schools, the military, hospitals, prisons, etc all these different disciplinary spaces. Um, but the focus on institutions immediately reveals a first chink in the modern state's armor, and that is namely that such regulatory institutions exist in space. And it's very difficult to dominate all spaces, and it's difficult in particular to dominate sea space. The sea was and is a vast area, increasingly well charted over time, perhaps, but much less under institutional control. Um, and to compound the problem, our pirates were moving targets, nomads, if you like. Um, and modern states always dislike nomads wherever they find them. Um, they always try to, always try to settle them. Um, and, but they are elusive figures who slide in and out of the reach of power. The corsairs operating out of North Africa, for example, remain throughout their history a challenge to regulation. They often avoided eat their home port um, and sold off captured goods in one of a number of Mediterranean black markets that existed for this purpose, thereby depriving the state of its powers of surveillance and its share. Um, this was a perpetual thorn in the side of the uh, various uh, modern uh, Corsarian states. Um, and it should not surprise us, therefore, that uh, the emerging modern state also resorted to good old-fashioned coercion to subdue pirates by force when needed. Those who could, in these particular states of uh, Europe, expanded their navies in the 19th century, increasing their capacity to police their sea routes. They launched relentless campaigns against pirates and their redoubts. And, and there was indeed a dramatic decline in the incidence of pirate attacks as the 19th century wore on. Um, as navies grew, the more powerful states also agreed to, agreed to ban privateering and corsairing as legitimate practices. So the, the signal event here is the Treaty of Paris in 1856, when the British, French, Austrian, Russian, and Ottoman empires, along with the Kingdom of Italy, outlawed the authorization of pirates by sovereign states and the practice of corsairing slash privateering more or less came to an end with a few straggling exceptions, such as those, such as the use of privateers um, actually by the Confederate States um, in the, during the American Civil War. As a side note, I would say, as we know, of course, piracy itself was not altogether eliminated, not then and not now. 
and as recently as the year 2010, there were uh, 445 incidents of piracy recorded worldwide. And it proves much more difficult, I think, to uh, stamp out the allure of the, private, of, of the pirate life. Uh, pirates, as we know very well, thanks to popular culture, also here, they developed coherent sets of values and meanings that consciously challenged challenge those of the ruling elite. Now, I don't want to be overly romantic about pirates, as tempting as that may be, because they, after all, were practitioners of violence, with all the unpleasantness entailed. They could be hard and ruthless men, and a few women, I should add, who preyed on the weak and the vulnerable. And still, there are features of pirate moral codes that had much appeal, and they presented a direct and conscious challenge to hegemonic design. Many, Euro many of the European pirates came from sailing backgrounds and had served on other kinds of ships, on navy or merchant ships, um, before they uh, moved to piracy. Um, and on those ships, they had been subjected to very strict and hierarchical forms of discipline. Ship captains in the early modern period were given virtually unlimited power over their crews. Sailors had little in the way of rights. Treatment on board was exceedingly harsh and even murderous. Um, and, the modern, and, and the modern ship continued this tradition um, as a highly regulated space. Pirate ships, by contrast, were known for their egalitarian atmosphere and only lightly regulated until the moment of attack when then the captain assumed his full powers for the duration of the capture. Um, pirates also had chosen this life. They were not, after all, after all impressed, uh, in mostly. And they could also choose to leave it. So the camaraderie of the ship was an important attraction for the recruitment and retention of pirate crews. Um, so the, this ethos spilled over, in part, in, onto privateering and corsair, corsairing vessels. Um, from what we know, there was definitely a marked preference among many sailors to sail on a, a privateer or a corsairing ship rather than on a, uh, a regular merchant or certainly naval vessel. Um, in, the, in the early modern period, some European sailors demonstrated their preference for life on North African corsairing ships by becoming what was called renegados, deserting their posts as sailors, aboard European Navy or merchant ships to sail with the Corsairs. Uh, we have, there are many cases uh, of, of, sort of famous individuals, but take the case of John Ward in the 17th century, um, European rendering, of course. Uh, and he was, his background, he was an oppressed sailor in the English Navy, who then turned to pirate, then migrated to Tunis, converted to Islam, and eventually became captain of Searing ship. The existence of these renegados was a source of considerable anxiety back home, and they were often depicted as degraded, demonic uh, types. Here's, here is John Ward in his persona. <laughs> they were actually not insignificant in number. I mean, it, it, you know, in the late 16th century, for example, of the 35 captains of corsairing ships sailing out of Algiers, 22 of them, well over half, can be identified as Renegados. That's the captains of European origin. And we know that ordinary seamen, as I said, also failed, fared re relatively well with the corsairs. Um, they didn't share equally in the profits, of course, but uh, ordinary seamen from the estate records in Algiers, for example, uh, we can see that they uh, they are their their earnings compared favorably to those of their land-based counterparts. And some of these ships also had slave hands on board, who, interestingly enough, were usually entitled to some share of the take. And pirates in the period persist in laying claim to the mantle of countercultural hero. Um, they might be working on their own account or be primarily motivated by the promise of profit, but they often cast themselves in the role of social bandits, of outlaws driven by a higher purpose. 
Um, and they convinced others of this. Um, there's, of course, a back long backstory here. Uh, many of you may be familiar with uh, uh, St. Augustine when he tells the story of the pirate captured by Alexander the Great, who asked him, uh, and when Alexander the Great asked this pirate, how dare he molest the sea, the pirate replied, how dare you molest the whole world? Because I, because I do it with a little ship, I am called a thief. You doing it with a great navy, you are called an emperor. So a pirate spoke to the desire, which most, most of us harbor, to speak this kind of truth to power, stand up for ourselves, and, uh, and stand up for others in the face of oppression. Um, and it's a pirate tale that acquired a certain purchase, especially on the Middle East margins, at the moment when populations there found themselves on the receiving end of the violence of the expanding European empires. So here we come to our moment of transition, if you like, uh, or transformation. So we have an example in the person of Arhama bin Jabr, the famous pirate who operated from the northern coast of Qatar in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. This is drawn as he is drawn by an English artist. Uh, he was, by all accounts, very active and violent in his pursuit of ships and their cargo in Gulf waters, and he enjoyed a long career as a successful sea raider until the moment when he found himself in a losing sea battle with, actually with the ships of the Al Khalifa of Bahrain, and rather than surrender to his enemies, he ignited powder kegs to blow himself and his attackers sky high. Uh, British <laughs> accounts of his exploits, while they contain a grudging admiration of his bravery and seamanship, paint him as a self-interested pirate um, who disrupted peaceful trade in the Gulf. But there is another story told of his heroism and his egalitarianism. Uh, he has now actually entered the Qatari national curriculum um, as kind of a Robin Hood figure of some sort. Uh, many of his men are styled as former slaves who flock to his banner as an escape from oppression. And he's a national hero as well. He protected the land of Qatar from the aggressive Al Khalifa. In recent years, he has not only been made the star protagonist in a novel, but has also been commemorated in the form of having a new national shipyard of Kato named after him. So we can harbor some doubts, I think, about whether Arhama, if he were alive and well today, would be a law-abiding citizen of the Qatari state. Um, but the state is quite happy to weave uh, the heroic tale of a dead pirate into the national uh, narrative. And towards the other end of the region, uh, in Algiers, uh, we find the statue of Raiz Hindu, a corsair who sailed between 1795 and 1815 in the twilight times of Algerian corsairing. His is a tale of humble origins. Uh, he was the son of a tailor who found his vocation at sea and worked his way up from cabin boy to captain of a corsairing ship. He is celebrated for his naval exploits, including his captures of valuable European prizes and his vigorous defense of Algiers against foreign attackers. He also has a stirring story of demise, and perhaps we go back here to the heroic body. Um, when the American Navy attacked with overwhelming force in 1815, he fought to his death having sworn his mates to throw his wounded body into the sea rather than risk capture. Uh, this statue, uh, erected in 1987 in Algiers, stands witness to his honored place uh, in the Algerian national narrative. I want to suggest then that pirates were pivotal, if complex, figures in the transition from the early modern to the modern state in the Early modern states enlisted them in state service, although it was always an uneasy relationship because pirates could be counted upon to resist supervision and to pursue their own agendas when they could. As the emerging modern states in Europe aspired to ever greater levels of control of their populations and their seas, however, there was no 
room for cooperation with such unruly elements, and pirates were targeted for elimination. But although pirates challenged state power, they also played an essential role in the state's self-justification. Uh, pirates demonstrated the dangers that lay beyond the boundaries of power. The wild and lawless spaces of the sea were spaces of peril. And it was only as the modern state developed its means and monopoly of violence that these spaces could, that it could claim to make these spaces safe, or nearly so. So we see the British lauded their own takeover of the Arab Gulf waters as a triumph over piracy, the piracy that had plagued the area. And the French justified their invasion of Algeria as an attack on a nest of pirates. The buildup of the modern state's military might in the form of modern navies, its monopoly of force, its extension into much of the world, owes a great deal to the actual or imagined threat of piracy on the margins. State power requires those who live in a state of exception to return to Agamemnon's insight. A judicial order can be suspended for a time, say in time of war, but it can also be suspended in perpetuity for certain classes of people like pirates. Uh, these enemies of all humankind um, and the highwaymen, they both stand um, in unusual relations to the realm of law and right. Their very existence endows the state with unbridled power, the power it needs to deal with the pirate or the bandit or the unlawful combatant as it sees fit. So our pirates out on the Middle East edges served as a pretext for the extension of the grasp of the European imperial state and as the template for the various forms of extrajudicial state abductions, incarcerations, and assassinations that haunt our world today. At the same time, however, our pirates on the margins uh, clearly continue to call to their countrymen to resonate as heroes who asserted counter-hegemonic values and eluded the control of imperial powers at the critical moment. Um, so ultimately, I, I think, I'd like to think that our pirates demonstrate the elusiveness of the goal of domination over those who stand, particularly those who stand out at the margins of space, of law, uh, of social values. Thank you.